all hear me? So let me re review where, where we got at the end of last time. So for spherically symmetric Einstein mother systems, right, given spherically symmetric asymptotically flat initial data. So remember, uh, last time we talked about the case where the initial data had either one or two asymptotically flat ends. Uh, today, I will only talk about the one-ended case because in any, it's, it is the more, it is the physical case. So, okay, I will talk about this case. So, uh, so Harvey, at the end of his lecture, talked about the maximal Cauchy development of general sort of initial data for the Einstein equations, more generally, Einstein mother equations. So uh, what we said was the following, that uh, uh, the maximal Cauchy development of spherically symmetric initial data okay, is itself spherically symmetric and moreover can be covered by a system of global double null coordinates. Okay, so coordinates u comma v such that the metric takes this form here. All right. Moreover, you can, without loss of generality, for the reasons that uh, we said last time, you can assume that the range of the coordinates u and v is bounded. Okay? So you can think of the, the, the pair of coordinates as defining a bounded map of, of m into two-dimensional Minkowski space. Okay? And it's precisely the image of such a map that we call Penrose diagram. Okay? So because, by definition, the maximal Cauchy development is globally hyperbolic, admitting the initial data as a Cauchy hypersurface, then just that fact, global hyperbolicity upstairs, okay, it translates into something downstairs about P. Okay? And uh, in the one-ended case, what, what it translates to is, is the following. So there's this boundary sigma, which was just the initial data, okay? and there's this boundary gamma, which corresponds to the fixed points of the SO3 action. And there has to be such a boundary since I've restricted to the one-ended case. Okay? So, um, so this function R is actually zero on that boundary and it is strictly positive everywhere else in P. Okay? And P itself as a subset of R1 plus one is not globally hyperbolic, okay? But it has the property that any point in P here if you follow back a uh, null curve in uh, this direction, you'll hit either gamma or sigma. Okay? Whereas if you follow a uh, null curve in this direction, you'll hit sigma. Okay? So, uh, so that's the analog of global hyperbolicity at, at the level of this uh, quotient. And from that, it follows immediately that you can decompose the boundary of P. And now when I say the boundary, I mean the boundary except for this, okay? the new boundary that you get because this, you, you're looking at it as a subset of R1 plus 1. You can decompose the boundary. And what does the boundary look like? It looks like it, it potentially has a null segment coming in from this point. I say potentially because this could be empty. Uh, it uh, potentially has a null segment coming in from a, a future endpoint of this gamma. Okay? Again, could be empty. And then the rest of the boundary is generated by things I want to call first singularities. Okay? So these are points such that they are entirely preceded by a characteristic rectangle which is in P, okay? except for the endpoint. So, well, the whole rest of the boundary could just be first singularities, so that's exactly the case in, in Oppenheimer-Schneider. Um, but uh, alternatively, from, from any given first singularity, you can also have these null pieces. Okay. So, I encourage you to think about uh, why this is true. This is really a very simple exercise in sort of, you know, the geometry of, I don't know, globally hyperbolic subsets of two-dimensional Minkowski space or something. So, okay. So that, that is the claim. So what, what I want to do now, so, so so far everything has really been, you know, sort of basically trivial as far as what I said about P. So I want us to start putting in more meat into this. So um, now I want to start using 
the equations. But I actually, we are not really going to be using the equations yet because we don't yet have equations. What do I mean by that? So, um, so for now, I'm, I'm, I'm really going to be uh, uh, in this world. So th these are the, the, the Einstein equations for general energy momentum tensor. Okay? And of course, okay, when you're in this world, you can think of the right-hand side as a definition. Okay, if I haven't yet told you, you know, what matter this is and what equations the matter satisfies, okay, the, you know. Um, but nonetheless, let's, let's uh, uh, first just do this to introduce some notation. So, okay, if you write the Einstein equations for general energy momentum tensor um, in this double null coordinate system, okay, then uh, the uh, energy momentum tensor decomposes uh, like this, okay? And I claim to you that the, the, the Einstein equations, all the information in the Einstein equations is, uh, is in these four equations, okay? So, um, already you, you, you'll notice that, okay, this is a sort of a wave equation for R on sort of, actually, you can think of it as a wave equation on, on you know, that as a subset of Minkowski space. This is a wave equation for, for, for log omega. And uh, these, uh, these equations actually have a name, okay, in a much more general setting. These are the so-called Raishaduri equations for null hypersurfaces. So if, if, if you know sort of more generally, okay, uh, this is a constant u hypersurface. d by du is this way, so this is a constant u hypersurface. And this is a constant v hypersurface, right? u equals constant, v equals constant. And secretly, these, these two equations are the Raishaduri uh, equations, so this is only relevant if, if you know what that means, uh, in, in this and this null hypersurfaces respectively. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll um, sort of use these very, very shortly. So, um, okay, so of course without, uh, if you want, if, if I don't introduce any other assumptions, then I'm not going to get anything. So let me now introduce the first uh, assumption. Uh, and that is that uh, our mother model, whatever it is, satisfies uh, the null energy condition. So that's to say that these components of the energy momentum tensor are not negative. Okay? Of course, again, since I haven't yet discussed any particular matter, you can think of this as a, just a, an assumption on, on, the, on the Riemann curvature. Okay? It's just the assumption that the Riemann curvature satisfies uh, the uh, the um, Ricci curvature satisfies uh, R U U is greater than or equal to zero, R V V is greater than or equal to zero. So sometimes this is called the null curvature condition. Okay. So um, so why why is this uh, uh, immediately relevant? Well, you see that this immediately introduces a certain monotonicity uh, in this uh, and this equations, which may be familiar. Uh, to people from the proof of Penrose's incompleteness theorem, because that's exactly what comes in there. Okay? So under this assumption, okay, we immediately have that these terms have a sign. Okay. So um, I'm going to uh, introduce um, another assumption. Actually, the sort of relevance of this assumption uh, was sort of first really uh, highlighted by Christodoulou, which is uh, what I'll call the uh, no anti-trapped surfaces assumption. So uh, my other assumption that I want to make, maybe I'll write it here, is that uh, du of r is less than zero, okay, on sigma. Okay, so remember, d by du is uh, this direction. Sigma is initial data, and you should think that I am free to impose assumptions on initial data. That's sort of the only place where I, I'm allowed to impose assumptions. Um, so in, in, in particular, this tells you that uh, no 
So if you think of these points of sigma as spheres in the initial data, okay, they cannot be what's known as uh, anti-trapped or, or, or past-trapped surfaces. Okay? So, um, so why is this relevant? Well, we can see immediately. So let me uh, give you a little lemma, which is sort of... Uh, uh, trivial, as, as you'll see. So, uh, so again, let this be any constant u curve, uh, and uh, let. So, I'm going to just let this be any constant v curve. Okay, in P. Okay. So, uh, so here is my claim. Um, so, if let's look at this one first dv of r is less than equal to zero some point here at p, then it's less than equal to zero uh, at q, any point to the future of p along the constant u curve. Okay, and uh, similarly here, so if um, the u of r is less than or equal to zero, let's say here, okay, then the u of r is less than or equal to zero here. And similarly, uh, if I have strict inequality here, I have strict inequality here, and similarly if I have strict inequality here, I have strict inequality there. So, um, so uh, okay. How, <laughs> so the proof is trivial, but okay, you just have to uh, know this one thing. Okay. So remember, double null coordinates, as we've said many times, okay, are non-unique, okay, because you can always rescale u and you can rescale v, okay, by arbitrary functions, okay, of the old u and the old v, okay, as long as those functions are, let's say, monotonically increasing. Okay, in the sense that the derivative is strictly positive. All right, so, um, so in particular, uh, 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 a nice exercise, you know, given any, let's say, uh, this is a constant uh, u curve, you can rescale the v coordinate here, okay, so that um, omega, omega is identically 1 here. Okay? And it's clear that you can do this if you think about it geometrically, because actually that's just saying I'm going to parameterize this affinely. I'll keep my u coordinate as it was, and I'll reparameterize this affinely. Okay. So, um, well, if you change the, the, the v coordinate like this, you never change the sign of dvr. Okay? And the reason that you never change the sign of dvr is that, uh, again, you're, you're always rescaling by something which is monotonically increasing. So these rescalings preserve the sign. Okay, and that should be clear because, of course, the sign of dvr and dur is something geometric. Okay. It's only depending on the direction, okay, not on how you're scaling the coordinates. All right, so you go to this coordinate where omega equals 1, and, well, now this equation is just saying that d squared u... Uh, I'm sorry, well, I should, if I'm doing this one, I should look at this one. This equation here is telling you that d, dv squared r is less than or equal to zero, okay, from which both these uh, relations hold with respect to that v-coordinate. Okay, but again, now you go back to your favorite v-coordinate v that you had because sort of the, the, the sign of dv of r is independent of the parameterization. Okay, so similarly here. So, uh, so let me give you uh, two corollaries of this. So the first corollary, <laughs> and this is sort of the, if you want, the motivation for this. So since we assume du of r is less than zero initially, okay, uh, and since every point in the space-time, okay, is accessible to initial data by going backwards in this direction, and this is a constant v-curve, Okay? It follows from, from this relation with, with the strict inequality that uh, du of r 
is strictly less than zero um, in all of P. Okay. So that's that's uh, uh, interesting. You can almost it's tempting to. You know, this is sort of some. Uh, what this is telling you is that the, the notion of um, um, anti-trapped surface, okay, is non-evolutionary. That's to say, if you do not initially have an anti-trapped surface, you cannot form one in evolution, and this is sort of uh, different from the notion of trapped surface, okay, which do form in evolution. Okay. Anyway, so this will be actually quite convenient. Um, there's another corollary, um, which is that uh, we can now uh, define something uh, uh, to be called null infinity, and we can say a little thing about it. So uh, corollary two. Okay. So uh, I'm going to. Um, well, okay. Let me. Um, Yeah, I mean, there, there are various, um, yeah, so okay, let me just say it like this. So, um, so consider it's sort of tedious to write this in words, but maybe I will just once. Consider the subset of the boundary of P in uh, this ambient uh, one plus one dimensional Minkowski space. Um, so this, remember, this was the this boundary, okay? So the boundary is this, okay? With the property, okay, such that uh, so consider the uh, subset of the boundary. Uh, with a property that, um, so I'm looking at all, at all x, um, okay, so of all x in the boundary, okay, so here's x, okay, such that x is the endpoint of an outgoing null curve, so a constant b, a constant u null curve, okay, such that x, the endpoint of a uh, Null curve. Um, um, so I'll call these out. So since I'm in the one-ended case, okay, it's sort of natural. I call these outgoing, okay. So of a of an outgoing null curve, such that the curve is completely contained, first of all, in uh, P, okay. Except, of course, for its endpoint, which by definition isn't, and such that uh, r along this curve uh, goes to infinity, okay? So uh, what, what I want to do is I want to define a, 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 a piece of the subset, okay? A, a piece of the boundary of, uh, of P and I want to identify that with null infinity, okay? So, uh, so uh, let me already you know, give it this name, okay? So uh, let, let, let me consider this subset, which I'm gonna sort of denote like this, of all x uh, with this property that um, um, uh, sort of r uh, goes to infinity, okay, as you approach x, along uh, a null curve, which is completely contained in P. Okay. So what can I tell you uh, already about this uh, subset? Okay. So actually, uh, if you want, uh, I can, you might say, okay, what does it mean for R to go to infinity? What do I actually mean by that? I I'm willing to even make it sort of weaker. Let me even just say the supremum of R is equal to infinity, okay? Because you know, a priori, maybe R has very weird behavior, oscillates, etc. So let's immediately make make some um, 
remarks. So first of all, uh, what I just changed is basically irrelevant. Because in reality, by what we showed, right, by this relation here, okay, um, if r is to go to infinity in any way, so if the supremum of r is going to be infinity on this null curve, then r has to be monotonically increasing, okay? Because once the v derivative of r becomes zero or negative, okay, then it will stay negative, okay, and r its supremum will not, okay. So in reality, okay, I could have said this in the first place. Doesn't matter, okay. If the supremum is infinity, R will actually increase monotonically. To infinity. Great. Um, but moreover, so here's the claim. Um, so then, um, I plus is a subset of uh, the, 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 the null curve coming from here, okay, from this point, okay? So I plus is actually a subset of this, okay? But moreover, I claim it, it, it is a, it's a connected uh, uh, interval, okay? So I plus, in fact, okay, I plus Is, is a connected interval, okay, which may or may not, well, first of all, it may be empty, okay, no one says that it, it's not empty, and it may or may not include its endpoint, okay, but it's a connected interval. Okay, so let's see, so this is, uh, as we'll see, it's, uh, again, it is a trivial uh, uh, consequence of the monotonicity in Raishaduri, okay. So first of all, why, why, does, why can this point x not be on I plus? It's clear, okay? So uh, <laughs> let's suppose this point x was on I plus and draw these null curves, okay? We know from this corollary that du of r is less than zero. So that's saying that r is always decreasing in this direction, okay? So uh, the, the, the supremum of R everywhere here is always less than the supremum of R here, okay? But this is contained in some compact subset of initial data, so whatever that is, it's finite. Okay. So immediately this uh, no, trapped, no anti trapped surfaces uh, condition uh, tells you that uh, null infinity, <laughs> as I'm defining it, okay, <laughs> Can, can only be a subset of the part of the boundary which is, which is coming from here, if there is such a part, okay. So now, um, okay, so now why, why can it um, not look like some funny subset, okay? So what I'm gonna show you is, um, so if x, what's x, there's x, right? So if x is in I plus, then so is all of this. Okay, so again, this follows for the same reason. If x is in I plus, all right, then um, what does that tell me by definition? That tells me that this null segment, okay, is in P, all right, and R goes to infinity along here, okay? So, um, so, of course, here was uh, sigma, and r went to infinity along sigma, which is great. Now, suppose y over here, suppose y, y, ah, let me put the label here, suppose y was not in I plus. So what does it mean to not be in I plus? It means that, again, if I, if I draw this, okay, this all now has to be in the space-time because of the geometry, so it's in the space-time. Uh, uh, R does not go to infinity, okay? But again, the only way that R cannot go to infinity is that the supremum of R is bounded, okay? So R is less than or equal to some capital R everywhere there. Okay. Uh, so, well, 
I told you that R goes to infinity as you go this direction. So go very far out, okay? Such that over here, let's say, R is bigger than capital R. Okay? And now follow this. All right? Well, R is bigger than capital R. R is less than equal to capital R here. Okay? Then what does that tell you? That tells you that uh, somewhere in between, um, um, bum, bum, bum. Well, okay, I don't even <laughs> claim. <laughs> I don't even need that. Okay, let's just start here. Why, why say superfluous things? R is less than or equal to capital R here, okay? R supposedly is going to infinity here, okay? So I look at this, <laughs> this null curve, okay? So dur has to be positive somewhere, right? dur has to be positive. I can choose a point here such that R is bigger than, than capital R, right? If R goes to infinity as I go here, I can choose a point close enough to X such that R is bigger than capital R. Okay, so I just look at this segment. Here R is less than or equal to capital R. Here R is bigger than capital R. So there must have been some point here where dur is positive. Okay? But DUR is negative. Okay, so 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 that's sort of nice. Um, so um, so so that means that uh, we we can define this um, this um, piece of boundary. Okay, which I'll call uh, null infinity. Whatever it is, it's a connected interval with this as an endpoint if it's not empty, okay? And it has the property that R goes to infinity as you approach any point on null infinity, and those are the only points in the boundary with that property, okay? So by labeling a piece of the boundary future null infinity, okay, I am telling you that, oh, R does go to infinity as I go there, R does not go to infinity as I go there, okay? So, um, so this is very nice because in this world of spherical symmetry, we can define a notion of null infinity only using the monotonicity uh, properties. Okay, so there are no precise decay rates, sort of compactification, etc. Nothing. Okay, it's, everything is done just with monotonicity. Okay, so let me introduce a, a, an assumption. Okay, so. Um, so my assumption is that this is non-empty. So, okay, strictly speaking, I should not be in the business of introducing assumptions which are not assumptions on initial data, okay? So, um, so in practice, uh, the claim is that uh, you can uh, retrieve this assumption from sort of assumptions on initial data. And of course, there's a, there's a trivial way to receive to um, uh, retrieve this assumption, and that is to consider initial data, okay, such that the matter has compact support, okay? Because if the matter has compact support in, in spherical symmetry, then outside you are, you are Schwarzschild, okay? Maybe more generally, if you have charge, you want to say that the sort of the matter except for the, the Maxwell part has compact support, and then outside you'll be Rice or Nordstrom. Um, and well, uh, null infinity is non empty in those cases, and this property is inherited. Okay. So, uh, all right. So, okay. This, um, um, so this is very nice because, in, in, in particular, we, 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 we have defined some notion of uh, future null infinity. Let me write this uh, on the board. So, this is my future null infinity. So now, for instance, you can, you can immediately uh, define a uh, black hole region, okay? So black hole, if you want. is just the, 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 the complement 
uh, of the past uh, of future null infinity, where this is taken in, in the sense of the ambient ge geometry of uh, one plus one dimensional Minkowski space. Okay, so in particular, uh, okay. can already define for you, you know, what it means for the space time to have a black hole. So if this is the picture, you know, this everything here is in a black hole. Okay, but um, all right. So, uh, but remember that uh, weak Cosmic censorship, as uh, we've defined it, is not the statement that singularities are hidden in black holes. Okay? It is the statement that future null infinity is complete. So let me tell you what that means, because we can, uh, we can immediately sort of uh, define that. Um, so, and actually this, it's, it's, it's a, much more general um, definition, but let me not talk about it in, in, in generality. Let me just sort of specialize it to this setting of, of spherical symmetry where null infinity is meant in, in the sense that I've defined. Okay? So suppose here is your P, okay? and here is uh, null infinity. I'm just assuming that it's non-empty. Non okay? So what does it mean for null infinity to be complete? Uh, so, uh, so of course, if this is non-empty, then okay, there is a, at least one, uh, right? Uh, now, well, there's a lot of them because of the connectivity uh, uh, statement. But anyway, so here there is there is in particular one um, uh, outgoing null curve that goes to null infinity, along which, of course, R goes to infinity. Okay. So, uh, so the statement is is then the following that um, I uh, parallel translate uh, I parallel translate uh, an ingoing uh, uh, null curve, okay? And again, this is canonical, uh, it's sort of an ingoing radial null curve, okay? Uh, along uh, this. And, uh, right? Okay. And I look at uh, now the ingoing null curves. So these should be straight lines in, in this picture. Okay. Generated by this vector. Okay. So these are, of course, just the constant V curves. Okay for as long as they remain in the past of future null infinity. Okay, so suppose future null infinity ends here. And remember, with this definition, future null infinity a priori could include its, its, its future endpoint, or it might not, okay? The way I've defined it, it's not clear. So uh, consider these curves, and uh, consider the, the affine length, okay, of these curves as measured by this, uh, vector. So remember, I, see, I, wa I want to measure the length of null curves. But of course, null curves have zero length no matter how long they are. Of course, you can talk about their affine length, but to normalize their affine length, you have to choose sort of the, the affine parameterization. So I'm using this vector to, to choose the affine parameterization. So um, if uh, sort of this affine length goes to infinity, okay? Then I will say that null infinity is future complete. And if this affine length goes to infinity, I will say uh, that null infinity is past complete. Okay? So if affine length, this whole affine length, I mean, in both this direction and this direction diverges, okay, as this point goes here, uh, we say okay. So this is the definition of what it means for future null infinity to be complete. Okay. So um, so I claim that uh, uh, if you think a little bit about uh, null coordinates, okay, uh, let's um, let's call uh, this curve. I don't know. Uh, 
u equals u naught, okay? So this is just, uh, so this affine length, the way I've defined it, I claim to you, is just uh, the integral uh, uh, du of omega squared u comma v over uh, omega squared uh, u naught comma v, okay? Where uh, the integral is from u naught, okay, to whatever, let's say this is u equals u1, and this is u equals u minus 1. So to u plus or minus 1. Okay. So it's explicit if you want. Okay. So that's, so if, if this goes to infinity as v goes to, so let this be v equals v naught, then I declare future null infinity to be complete. So, in practice, the past completeness, okay, sort of follows easily from assumptions on initial data. So, in particular, if indeed my initial data, the matter, is of compact support, okay, then I claim the, the past completeness of null infinity follows from the past completeness of the null infinity of Schwarzschild, okay? And if you think about it, that just follows from the fact, this is a good exercise, that in sort of Bondi U coordinates, okay? Uh, so Bondi U coordinates is trying to normalize this so that it be one, okay? So if you normalize this so that it be one at V equals V naught, okay? Then uh, the claim is that the, the coordinate U takes the range minus infinity to infinity, okay? So the fact that in this direction it goes to minus infinity is the past completeness, okay? So, uh, great, so that's, so, okay, we've made a little bit of progress. So now, you know, in principle, we have a completely well-defined formulation of weak cosmic censorship that we can entertain its truth or falseness, namely, for our favorite einstein mather system that now we have to sort of consider, uh, uh, for generic initial data, future null infinity, as I've defined it, uh, be complete, okay? So, um, Everything I'm talking about is uh, for spherical symmetry. Everything. Now this definition, actually, if, if, if you're willing to drop the requirement that these stay in the past of future null infinity, you can make it without explicit reference to future null infinity itself. That's to say you can define the notion of having a complete future null infinity without having a future null infinity. <laughs> And actually, this definition has been made by uh, Christodoulou. And so it's a way of actually formulating weak cosmic censorship, you know, very generally without, you know, uh, depending on, you know, the sort of, in particular, you know, the old Penrose constructions of infinity that unfortunately, uh, you know, don't hold generically. Okay. So, um, very good. So now we can start uh, <laughs> section three. Uh, of, the, of the lecture series, namely uh, 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 consider Christodoulou's proof of weak and strong cosmic censorship for Einstein's scalar field restricted always to spherical symmetry. Okay. So uh, let me keep those equations on the board. In fact, let me throw in also the, the, the space-like uh, singularity conjecture, or some version thereof, since we, we talked about it, okay, uh, for spherically symmetric Einstein scalar field system. Okay, so, 
So, um, so let me uh, write down uh, uh, what uh, that uh, system is. So, um, so this is the, the, the Einstein equations. Well, I've already written them down here. Okay. Where the energy momentum tensor is that of a massless, minimally coupled scalar field. So this is the energy momentum tensor. Um, and if you want, from, from the divergence uh, of this, okay, it follows that the phi itself satisfies the good old wave equation on the metric background G. Okay, so the, the, the system is star um, with this as energy momentum tensor, and you can even think of this as a consequence of, of that. Okay. So, um, so what do these equations look like in um, 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 double null coordinates? Well, you can easily compute that uh, the component uh, TUV actually vanishes. So bye-bye these terms. Okay. And uh, this expression also vanishes, so goodbye to this. And now uh, it turns out that uh, TUU is nothing but DUV squared, and uh, TVV is nothing but uh, DVV squared. Okay. So, um, okay. So, uh, so these are sort of the, the, the Einstein equation. And if you want, you can also write down uh, uh, explicitly the, the, the wave equation. Maybe I, I won't do that unless I, I need it, okay? All right, so. Uh, it turns out that what's actually more useful than writing down uh, the wave equation is uh, and this is extremely useful for general spherically symmetric spacetime. So maybe I'll, I'll still write it uh, for general energy momentum tensor and then specialize to scalar field. Uh, so you can define something uh, quantity called M. Okay, so this is a function of U and V, which is uh, simply the following. It's this, so it's one minus uh, the you know, Lorentzian gradient squared of, of, of R, but lest you think that that's positive, I, I, I'll write it out explicitly. <laughs> okay? Okay? So this is the Lorentzian gradient of R squared, this expression here. Okay. So, um, so this uh, was first written down, well, in some other coordinates a long time ago. Uh, and uh, in that context, it maybe should be called the misner sharp uh, mass. But this actually uh, coincides with the Hawking mass of the sphere u, v upstairs. Okay? So I'll refer to this as the Hawking mass. Okay? This, this is the Hawking mass that you may have heard of. So why is the Hawking mass uh, great? Uh, because it satisfies the following evolution equations with respect to u and v. And again, this is a general, I'll write the general case here. Um, maybe I'll get the factors right. Maybe I won't. Okay. Um, so, in general, it looks like this. Okay, so this is sort of dual. And of course, uh, specialized to uh, the Einstein scalar field system. Okay. Uh, of course, these, these components uh, don't exist. Okay. So we just get whatever. So let me write it like this. Um, 
Uh, that I'm bum bum. Okay, and in this in this case, I'm going to write it uh, like this. Um, um, So uh, why uh, have I chosen to write it uh, like this? Well, uh, so, um, ah, OK, maybe I should make uh, a note. Uh, so I uh, told you that uh, I, 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 <laughs> I told you that TUU and TVV are uh, what I wrote here. So in particular, these are greater than or equal to zero. Okay? So this mother model does satisfy the null energy condition. In fact, it satisfies the, the dominant energy condition, which is just that these should be greater than or equal to zero, and sh so should TUV, which is zero, actually. Okay. So these, these are greater than or equal to zero. Um, so, uh, so in particular, everything that I've said so far, uh, which, remember, was using that assumption, it applies to, to this mother model. Okay? Um, so in particular, uh, so given that I'm always assuming du of r less than zero on data, I have that this quantity is always positive. Okay, so uh, this is telling me that uh, this is always greater than or equal to zero, dv of m. Okay. On the other hand, uh, I claim to you that m is uh, always um, uh, zero on gamma. Okay, so uh, so I'll, I'll 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 leave it as a little exercise for you to show because it's it's sort of uh, it's actually very easy. Uh, so it's very easy to show that m has to be greater than or equal to zero uh, everywhere on sigma. Okay, so exercise. And now, since every point of P, okay, is uh, uh, preceded, I mean, if I go in this direction, I either hit sigma or gamma, okay, and this is a constant U curve, so this is d by dv. This tells me that th this uh, Hawking mass is globally non-negative, okay. So this will be useful. Uh, all right, so, uh, uh, so that's the first remark. And now the second remark that I want to make, uh, which sort of there's a big story behind this, is the following. So, Proposition. So um, this uh, uh, Einstein scalar field mother model is uh, what I'll call tame. So this is actually a terminology invented by a former student of mine, Jonathan Komami. Uh, so let me write it like this. So Einstein scalar field is tame. And what this means is the following. So this is just a, a word to describe the, the phenomenon that I will tell you, but it's useful to have a word because this phenomenon is extremely general for spherically symmetric Einstein mother systems. Okay. So the, the, the statement is the following. Um, all first singularities not arising from the center, and I'll remind you what that means. So remember, this is the boundary, okay? And the first singularity was a point on the boundary such that it was preceded completely by a characteristic rectangle 
contained, except for that point, in P, right? That's a first singularity. So all first singularities not uh, arising from, from, from the center. Not arising from the center is just, remember, here's the center, OK? Uh, well, I, I also call, if, if the center has sort of an endpoint like this, I also call this a first singularity, OK? Because, well, it's preceded. OK, it's not a rectangle because it can't be, but anyway. OK, so any other first singularity, OK, has the property that the infimum of R in that rectangle B0. So let me uh, uh, try to explain a little bit. Okay. Uh, so in general, what, what, why, why, why do I sort of distinguish these first singularities? Okay. Well, it's very clear that uh, if this is indeed the maximal Cauchy development of uh, an Einstein mother system like this one, okay, then in order for this to actually be a boundary point, okay, these equations have to break down at that point. Because if these equations do not break down at that point, okay, if these equations do not break down at that point, okay, then you can go very close to that point, okay, and you can sort of erect initial data. If there was no breakdown as you come close to that point, you should be able to apply local existence for these equations and continue beyond and falsify that this is on the boundary. So given a first singularity, you know that something goes wrong there with these equations. Okay. Now, a priori, lots of things could go wrong. For instance, phi could blow up. Du phi could blow up. All sorts of things could happen without anything else. Omega could blow up. Okay? Or omega could go to zero. That's also a degeneracy of these equations. R could blow up. Well, it can't. That's the first thing we showed. R does not blow up on first singularities. R can only blow up you know, on what we define to be null infinity, and those points are not super singular. But anyway, R could go to zero. Okay. And uh, what this proposition says is that if R does not go to zero, then none of those other bad things can happen, okay? And thus, it cannot be a first singularity. So if it is a first singularity, R has to go to zero. Okay. So um, I, won't, uh, uh, I won't give the proof of this. It's not so hard, although it's not completely uh, trivial. Uh, it's much, much easier than the, the main difficulty of the, of the proof, which Again, I won't give, but I'll, I'll try to talk about uh, a, bit, a little bit later. Uh, but, but this is certainly the first thing to, to try to learn uh, if, 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 if you want to understand a little bit of the analysis. Okay? Because it's reasonably elementary, but there's already content. And uh, a good exercise is to try to sort of prove this for a more complicated uh, einstein mother system. Okay? So that's a good exercise. So uh, a reference. Uh, for the sort of this notion is a, a, a paper that I wrote uh, a while ago called uh, I don't know, uh, Spherically Symmetric Spacetimes with a Trapped Surface, and also the paper of Jonathan Komemi. I don't remember the title, but you can, you can look it up, where he proves uh, in particular this, this statement for a much more um, difficult example of the, the charged uh, scalar field. Okay. But in any case, okay. So, um, so I claim we can already run away with this fact, and we can already um, um, uh, extract a, a corollary just from this proposition, which suddenly will simplify incredibly our, our uh, picture of what the structure of space-time can look like, and then we can go from there. Um, so I have to erase something, so maybe I'll... I'll go here and try to fit what I want to say on this board.
So corollary. So P can look like the following things. Okay? So case one, this was sigma, this is gamma, this is I plus. Okay? We know, by the way, an explicit solution that has this property. So Minkowski space is an explicit solution of our system with phi vanishing, and it's exactly like that. Okay? Turns out that uh, one, one, one can show that small perturbations of Minkowski space also look like that. That's, uh, that's the stability of Minkowski space for this model in spherical symmetry, which is also a relatively easy thing to prove, but a good exercise uh, for someone wanting to learn about these things. So this is one case. Um, uh, case, um, let me see how I numbered them because I don't want to uh, uh, sort of number them uh, uh, in some funny case. So case two is what we really don't want, namely I have a first singularity on the center from which comes uh, 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 sort of the, the boundary looks just this null cone and this meets off null infinity. Okay, and finally, case three. Okay, so case three is the following: that um, I have null infinity, and null infinity, it's it's past. Okay, is not the whole space time. There's more of its past. Okay, so I claim in this case, I can I can already say the following. So I might have. Can you even see some people? I guess this was very unfortunate. Let me draw case three somewhere else because um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw. Okay, this is sort of awful, but I'll draw case three here because uh, it's sort of. So I'll explain to you the so um, so case three. Let me draw like this. So this is gamma, okay. So in case three, I am allowing a possibly empty null piece. Emanating from the top of gamma. I'm allowing a possibly empty null piece emanating from here. And everywhere else, my claim is that R extends continuously to 0. So, uh, so the, the, the corollary I claim is that. Um, once you know this, okay, then uh, the only possible uh, Penrose diagrams are one, two, and, and three. Okay? So it's either this, this, or this. And moreover, let me tell you uh, uh, something else. Okay? So in, 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 in cases one and two, one and three, sorry, then null infinity is complete. And uh, you may have noticed something else. So I've drawn this as a circle, which is uh, sort of an open circle, not a closed circle. So uh, I, I, I mean to say, by doing that, that this point is not on null infinity in this case. And one way I can depict that is by telling you that R on this null curve, which I'm calling H plus, okay, 
it asymptotes to some limit, which I'll call r plus, which is less than infinity. And in fact, I can tell you something more. Uh, uh, not only is r plus less than infinity, but it's less than uh, 2mf, where this is the so-called final bonding mass. Uh, and you know, very, very quickly, using, uh, using uh, this monotonicity, And the fact that in the past of null infinity, dv of r better be greater than or equal to 0. Quick lemma. So in the past of null infinity, I have that du of m is less than or equal to 0. So if you think about it, I can define a, a limiting value of m here. So my assumption on initial data, OK, is that the supremum of m initially is, is finite, OK? So that's, if you want, the only version of asymptotic flatness that I need, OK? So uh, from that, it follows that you can define something you can call the Bondi mass. I'll call it capital M of u by just looking at the limit okay, of little m as you go there. And that, that's a monotonic limit, so it exists. It's just the supremum. Yes? R monotonically uh, attend, uh, sort of, it has limit monotonic, so R is non-decreasing on this null curve, which I call the horizon. And it attends a limit, which I call r, r plus, which is finite. And I'm actually asserting that r plus is less than or equal to this quantity, which, let me say what this quantity is for just a second. So by monotonicity, you can define m u. And by this, you can, you can convince yourself that m u is non-increasing as a function of u at, at null infinity. So mf is just the infimum of mu. Okay. So you can call that the final Bondi mass. Okay. So uh, this type of equation is sometimes called a Penrose inequality. But this is the actual Penrose inequality <laughs> that has not yet been proven outside the circle symmetry. That's to say, I'm telling you that the area of the event horizon uh, is, is, is bounded by the, the final bonding mass. OK, so this is the strongest type of statement you could, you, could, you could want. So all these are reasonably elementary things to prove. So unfortunately, uh, I, 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 I won't prove this here. But uh, this is all proven in the, the paper that uh, I mentioned before, uh, uh, spherically symmetric uh, space times with a trapped surface. Um, and, uh, and let me uh, emphasize that uh, that paper is not about this system. It is about any system that satisfies that proposition. Okay? So that's why, if you want, uh, this proposition, this, this, this sort of property deserves a name that just from this uh, sort of name uh, just from this property, you can, you, you can say all this. And finally, let me just make one other remark. Uh, a, a sufficient condition for three. So I'll keep the equations, but I'll maybe erase this. So a sufficient condition for three, okay, is that 
there exists, and hence the name of that paper. Uh, at least one trapped or marginally trapped surface. So there exists a, a, a u comma v such that dv, I'm sorry, of um, r at u comma v is less than or equal to zero. So given that uh, du of r is always strictly negative, okay, then if at a point p, okay, if at a point p, dv of r is less than or equal to zero, then that point upstairs is a trapped surface. Okay? So uh, I should say if it's strictly less than zero, it's what I'll call a trapped surface. If it's less than or equal to zero, it's what I'll call a marginally trapped surface. So, uh, so why, why is this true? Well, it's clear because uh, by the process of elimination. You see, um, by our monotonicity that we've used several times now, it cannot be the case that dv of r at, th at this point or at this point okay, is less than or equal to, to zero. Because if dv of r is less than or equal to zero, then it has to be less than or equal to zero there. Similarly here. But it cannot be, because r supposedly goes to infinity. Okay. So the only Penrose diagram that allows it is that one. Okay. So you can read about this in, in that paper, but it's actually, uh, I mean, th that, that paper of mine is not <laughs> very deep. And it's, uh, I think it's even better to try to just prove this, prove what I said from this on your own, OK? because literally you're just using monotonicity properties. Although I should say the last part is maybe slightly more subtle with the Penrose inequality. Okay. So, um, so now uh, in the remaining time, I'll uh, give uh, an ever so slightly uh, sort of more uh, elaborate uh, proposition, which will be the, then the, the key to the discussion of um, weak cosmic censorship and strong cosmic censorship in this model. So unfortunately, I have to erase this. But I'll replace it with another proposition. So here's the, here's the, here's the claim. Proposition. And now this is really for the uh, Einstein scalar field system. Okay? So, so for Einstein scalar field, and under all the assumptions that I've been making on the data that, that, that we've talked about, okay? So for Einstein scalar field, uh, suppose this is gamma. Okay? And suppose that gamma ends in a first singularity, okay? Which will be the case uh, uh, in either case two or case three. In case one, there's nothing to do after all. In case one, future null infinity is complete. And, well, maybe it's a good exercise to show that this is inextendable. Okay. So suppose gamma ends in a, in a, in a first singularity, okay? Um, and uh, suppose, moreover, that there exists a sequence of trapped surfaces. In fact, all I need is marginally trapped, but it doesn't matter. Um, let me write it like this. So if there exists a trapped surfaces, uh, so, OK, uh, tending to this point. Okay. Suppose there exists such a sequence. So remember, what is a trapped surface? It's just a, a point such that, uh, since we know du of r is negative everywhere, such that dvr is less than zero. 
So suppose there exists such a sequence, okay, in, in, in my space time. So then, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what the Penrose diagram of the space time is. Okay. So then, uh, P is the following. So P looks like this. Okay. Uh, R equals zero everywhere here. Okay. This is space-like, and uh, this is all first singularities. There are no null components here. It's all first singularities. Okay. It connects this point to this point here. Okay. And uh, in view of that, uh, so if this is the case, then everything is true. Okay. So then. Uh, so then the, let's say, you know, so I plus is complete, so the, the predicate of weak cosmic censorship, strong cosmic censorship, and even space-like singularity conjecture understood just as the statement that the spherically symmetric Penrose diagram is this. I don't want to talk about what this boundary looks like upstairs because I don't want to define it, but just, you know, if, if you define that conjecture to mean that this is space-like in the spherically symmetric Penrose diagram, then that's true too. So everything is true. Okay, so then the so the, the the predicate of weak cosmic censorship, strong cosmic censorship, space-like singularity conjecture are true. So everything, 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 everything reduces to showing that for generic initial data. If I have, you know, if I'm not one, okay, then I'll have a sequence of, of trapped surfaces uh, that go there. Okay. So, uh, so this proposition is actually also very very simple, um, and uh, in some sense, what what what's key to this proposition. Um, so you shouldn't think the, the, the difficulty in, uh, in the proof of the cosmic censorship conjectures, this is you know, really the achievement of Stodulu, is showing that indeed this happens generically. Okay? But uh, it's already very interesting that somehow everything, everything, everything reduces to a completely local question about this point. Okay? So I want to draw uh, your attention to that. And actually, uh, let, let me draw your attention to one other uh, fact. Uh, so uh, this sort of statement that there exists such a sequence uh, is sort of, you could, you could, you could also call this a, a conjecture. You could call this the, the, the trapped surfaces conjecture, which sort of says that you know, every first singularity okay, is associated with a trapped surface and by saying as associated with a trapped surface, I mean, you know, actually the, the, there exists this sequence that gets closer. So there is some uh, much more general formulation of that uh, conjecture, uh, not, in, not in spherical symmetry, but in, in complete generality. It uses the language of TIPS, T-I-P's, if you know what that is. And that, um, uh, it can be shown that that conjecture would, would imply weak cosmic sun. So, um, so that's, um, uh, that's interesting. Of course, in uh, note, in view of what's already written on the board, in this model, and in any tame model, okay, if I just want to know weak cosmic censorship, I just need to know that there exists one of these, okay? Because of what's written in the remark, okay? If there is a single trapped surface, then I know I'm in case three, and future null infinity is complete. Okay. So, uh, so having the sequence, uh, it turns out, is, is important uh, so as to, to, to rule out uh, uh, a null component like this, okay, which could be an obstruction for strong cosmic censorship, because a null component like this 
uh, could admit a, a smooth, let's say, extension through there. Okay, so uh, I'll end in well, one minute. Let me just already whet your appetite with um, uh, how you how you show this, uh, this proposition. So, uh, so I claim that the key to showing this proposition uh, is, um, is the following. Um, so if, if you look at this equation here, okay, I haven't written it in a very useful way, but I can rewrite it in view of my definition of M and, uh, well, let me get the, <laughs> the factor right. So I claim that I can rewrite this um, uh, equation as uh, du dvr equals minus m over 2r squared omega squared. Okay? On the other hand, I've just told you that m is greater than or equal to 0 everywhere. So. It's sort of funny, this, this particular mother model, and here it's really, really important that TUV vanishes. In addition to Raishaduri monotonicity, it has an extra monotonicity, namely this monotonicity. Okay? So, um, so you might want to see, let this be an exercise, how much uh, of uh, the proposition uh, you, can, you can already prove just using uh, this extra monotonicity, okay? So it's actually uh, a good exercise. How much of that proposition you can prove just by using this, okay? So we'll uh, uh, continue with, with this, uh, I guess, on, on Friday in the last lecture. Uh, and then I'll hopefully have enough time for an abridged version of lecture four, uh, which will be about the, the, the stability of, of um, the Ryzen Nordstrom and Kerr Cauchy horizon, a phenomenon that is not seen at all in this model, in fact, uh, precisely because of this proposition that I've just uh, uh, formulated. Okay.